But it didn't happen. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons is because we were using that soft language, that language that takes the life out of life. And it is a function of time. It does keep getting worse. I'll give you another example. Sometime during my life, sometime during my life, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. I wasn't notified of this. No one asked me if I agreed with it. It just happened. Toilet paper became bathroom tissue. Sneakers became running shoes. Information became directory assistance. The dump became the landfill. Car crashes became automobile accidents. Partly cloudy became partly sunny. Used cars became previously owned transportation. Room service became guest room dining. And constipation became occasional irregularity. At Marquette University, administrators demanded a student take down from his door a quote from a dangerous subversive that read, As Americans, we must always remember that we all have a common enemy, an enemy that is dangerous, powerful, and relentless. I refer, of course, to the federal government. What dangerous fifth columnist could have written such a thing? Would you believe Dave Barry? So we wondered, what would Dave Barry think of all this? We caught up with him at the offices of Miami Herald, where we asked him his thoughts on the case, on freedom of speech, and on the censorship of humor columnists on college and university campuses today. My name is Dave Barry, I'm a humor writer. Free speech is important to me because I've sort of made my living uh, writing about things that some people find offensive. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever written a column that somebody didn't find offensive. And periodically, people try to stop me from writing, or at least try to prevent newspapers from publishing something I've written. Well, I just don't know what has happened to the universities. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, certainly not an original observation on my part, but the least free uh, area of thought left in the United States seems to be the universities. The one place where you'd think free um, thought and free speech and, and you know, conflict of ideas would be most encouraged has somehow miraculously become the, the, the most restricted and constricted and, and just uh, constipated, intellectually constipated area of American life. Free speech is important everywhere, but particularly on college campuses. That's because they're an institution in which ideas are developed, presented, debated, evaluated. Outside the walls of the university, there are constitutional protections for saying things that, that might be wrong or that might be offensive. It's the university that imposes more stringent uh, restraints on speech than society at large. We're in a really sad state of affairs if it's the lawyers that have to tell the professors and university administrators what they can and can't say. We're learning all across Canada. If you want to start a sport hunting club, open a men's center, defend Israel's right to exist, analyze the sanction for the killing of infidels in the Quran, or any number of other wrong activities on a Canadian university campus, good luck. Canadian universities are not in the business of debating ideas. More and more, they're in the business of declaring and enforcing what is and is not acceptable to say and think. Well, of censorship, you were mentioning the college campus situation. You're totally right. I guarantee you there is less free speech at Berkeley than there is in the White House. The, the, t the threat from, thank you, one applause. <laughs> controversial to support affirmative action or not support it is controversial, but on many campuses, this Ward Connerly who goes around, he's a black man against affirmative action. I don't happen to agree with him, but it's something we should debate, but campuses say, no, if that's your opinion, you can't be heard. And, and who are these irresponsible, despicable professors and people who run this campus, who let this go on, and as you say, the place where ideas should be most alive, not most shunted down? Well, people always talk about PC and they throw the like term out screen. like... But they always throw it out just like it's a good party chat conversation. But really, don't you think at its core, it's it's really patently dangerous, isn't it? I mean, it's if extremely we extremely dangerous. There's a lot of things in this country that are never going to be solved now because you can't even get near it without all the right. uh, the, the alarms going off. Right.
spectacle represents the University of Cincinnati campus, and this dot represents its free speech zone. Yep, the administration limits demonstrations, pickets, and rallies to just 0.1% of the 137-acre campus, and students may be charged with trespassing if they use the zone without submitting a request 10 working days in advance. Free speech is most threatened today in the very places in America where you would think it would be absolutely the freest, our colleges and universities, where dissent and difference is punished, graded down, where conformity is rewarded, and where speech codes in a nation that so desperately needs to educate in liberty, where speech codes are the rule rather than the exception. I think people, some of the younger people were sort of scratching their heads about why this civility pledge that Harvard students were asked to do last year was such a big deal. Uh, it pressured them to sign uh, something that pledged themselves to count civility, kindness, inclusiveness uh, on par with intellectual right. attainment. And the interesting thing is kind of like, you know, students of the 60s would have uh, said, so you can't make uh, me be I, nice. They would have yeah. literally given the finger. Yeah, right? they would have so. rioted. The saddest thing about Harvard, and mind you, I'm a graduate of its law school, I'm supposed to be a loyal alum, and I actually consider myself a loyal alum because I'm trying to bring Harvard back to the principles that it still claims it believes in, but doesn't practice, and that is respect for free speech, academic freedom, meaning respect or at least tolerance of the most views that are considered to be obnoxious, um, a retrograde evil. Uh, they're only words and or essays, and they should be completely protected. They're not. You could be thrown out of Harvard for saying something politically incorrect. The censorship at Harvard runs from top to bottom. Hello, my name is Jerry Croft, and uh, I'm a psych professor in California, and that was just an introduction. This is not about the university and freedom of speech. This is about academic psychology and how it is in, infected and impacted by this entire much larger uh, ethos that exists in university campuses. So I'm concentrating my efforts here on the role of academic psychology in, in this environment. So let's, let's ask ourselves, how did this all start? How did this zeitgeist begin. So here's a quote. It is a, a range of policies in academia around supporting multiculturalism through affirmative action, sanctions against anti-minority hate speech, perceived discrimination against political, social, or economic protected groups. Most prominently of those are those by gender, race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, and disability. Well, that sounds wonderful. Uh, sounds like a good idea. So in the course of this, oh, this process starts around the mid-1980s, flourishes in the 90s, and in the first part of the 21st century, really has grown to enormous uh, proportions. But there are some good things that happened from it. Uh, uh, we, and certainly many, many groups were very happy that we changed our language. Uh, Fireman became firefighter. Businessman became a business person. How nice if you're a female executive. Chairman became chairperson. How nice if you became the chairman of your department and you happen to be a woman. Stewardess, flight attendant, handicapped became physically challenged. And uh, probably a number of handicapped people thought that was a good move. So uh, our language has changed and our, our culture has changed. And uh, as this has evolved, this uh, political ethos has developed into a series of slogans and bumper stickers and uh, a point of view that is permeating uh, the universities uh, to perhaps too much of an extent. So uh, there was a study done that said that for of, of academic psychology departments that said that for every Republican faculty member, in a, psychological, in a psychology department, there are 12 Democrats. 
Now that is completely askew from the frequency of Republicans and Democrats in society as large. So psychology departments are particularly impacted with leftist, progressive, so-called liberal thinking. Okay, now as soon as you talk like that, people start to think, oh, you must be one of those right-wing, conservative, Fox News, uh, reactionary, pro-family uh, demagogues, because there's this dualistic thinking that we're either this way or we're that way. Either you're with us or against us. I wrote a book about 14 years ago called Psychology Underground, which basically looked at this problem and uh, was expressing basically a hope that psychological research would come out from under this cloud of political, politically driven research and would start uh, a, mo a more apolitical uh, and scientific approach to the topics that confront psychology. Well, uh, that dualistic thinking, you're either here or there, you're either with us or against us, still pervades um, this, this, this topic. And I would like to show us a little uh, reminder of our history here. Either you're with us, either you love freedom and with nations which embrace freedom, or you're with the enemy. There's no in-between. You're either with us or you're with the enemy. That's, that's clear. I will continue to make that clear. So there's no in-between, he said. So let's think about that, all right? So we have uh, uh, millions of Americans who did not approve of us going 6,000 miles from our borders and attacking a country, killing 100,000 people under false pretenses that we thought they were building nuclear weapons and we thought... Uh, they had something to do with Al-Qaeda and, and bin Laden, neither of which was true. So if we didn't support that, what we, uh, you, the only other choice is that you're, you're, you're with bin Laden. Well, millions of Americans occupied a third space, which was not either of George Bush's alternatives. Similarly, in this discussion, there is a third place in between the political zeitgeist and anti-zeitgeist that is going on, uh, where uh, intelligent and rational people who are not right or left, who just want to see psychological research uh, uh, return to uh, facing the issues of our day. Now, what does that mean? I would like to explore an example of something that does not fit in in the contemporary ethos that's going on here, okay? Pol Pot, um, named Salazar, uh, takes over Cambodia between 75 and 79 and becomes um, a, a, a delusional, paranoid leader who totally transformed the society. He, he called it Kampuchea. Every member of society was required to wear black, no one was allowed, mirrors were forbidden in Kampuchea, okay? If you were of, of had a beard or you, had, or you spoke French, off to the killing fields you went. Pol Pot, in four years, killed about 24% of the population of Cambodia. He killed more than twice the number of Cambodians that Jews were killed in Auschwitz, of over two million people, all right? And um, uh, there is a tremendous wealth of psychological material in studying this horrific Brave New World atrocity, okay? So here are some of the psychological issues connected with this event. In, and, I, I, and admittedly, in the United States, we didn't pay attention to Cambodia. Jane Fonda was talking about saving the whale when all of this was happening. Uh, we hardly covered it. There was only one politician, George McGovern, who was speaking about it. We had just left Vietnam. We were not interested. But that's many, many, many years ago. Psychology has many things to learn from this craziness. Uh, certainly, uh, Pol Pot was paranoid. His wife was mentally ill. There's a whole list of delusions that were going on inside of his very anal uh, administration of Phnom Penh. Uh, the ethnic cleansing campaign of Pol Pot was beyond comprehension. He all, if left to his own devices, he would have probably killed everyone over the age of 15 because he wanted to clean out 
the population and create a pure Khmer race that was untainted by capitalist degenerate values. Okay, so everybody's name had to be changed uh, to a monosyllabic name. All titles like father, mother, sister, brother, grandfather were eliminated. You could be killed if you called anybody mother or father. Families were separated. You didn't see your father or mother. It created a tremendous loss of identity and uh, acquiescence to being exploited and to, to tyranny. So there are topics on propaganda, on mass murder, on desensitization. Pol Pot taught uh, his soldiers to uh, torture monkeys so that um, they would ultimately get desensitized to screaming and hollering because they were about to be uh, dealing with human beings. So uh, it is a treasure trove of psychological knowledge to look into this problem. So if we look at the total number of peer-reviewed publications in psychology on Pol Pot, uh, scholarly scientific articles in the 21st century, we don't see that many, okay? We see about 22. That's a little more than one per year. All right, so let's compare that to something else. This is a, 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 from a, the psychological database archives of all psychological journals. Uh, LGBT is part of the political zeitgeist. That is a part of the political uh, ethos of those psychology departments. And it receives 58 times more attention than Pol Pot. No one is saying that uh, there isn't a lot to learn and in studying the LGBT community. However, the question could be raised is, is it really 58 times more compelling than what happened in Cambodia? Uh, uh, if you do this again and you look at other topics, like if you search the database for the word lesbian or you search the database for sexual orientation, which is part of the political zeitgeist, whereas Pol Pot is not, is not relevant to it. It's not that Pol Pot is against studying Pol Pot. It does not mean and condemn you for being against tolerance and the lack of discrimination and anything that's going on in that political sphere. It's just a neutral topic. <clears throat> but... Uh, the ratio of studies, these are peer-reviewed studies, 380 times more attention psychology is paying to lesbians than it is to Pol Pot. 730 times more attention is paid to sexual orientation than to this genocide that occurred in our lifetimes. <clears throat> so there is something askew. Let's take another topic, Rwanda, another genocide. In, our, in more of our lifetimes, 1994, a majority party called the Hutus decided to eliminate the Tutsis. They were a minority. <clears throat> the leaders of the government went on the radio and said that Tutsis are cockroaches and cockroaches have to be killed. It is everyone's obligation to get rid of the cockroaches in our society. And so this was proselytized in the media, on the radio, and 800,000 Tutsis were slaughtered in three months. It was a mass murder. The state of Georgia has as many people as uh, Rwanda. Imagine 800,000 people in Georgia were murdered in three months. <clears throat> That's what happened. Now, Madeleine Albright was the Secretary of State at the time. She doesn't talk about this incident very much. Uh, and uh, she uh, uh, played a role, say some authors, that she had actually asked UN troops to be removed from Rwanda at the, at the beginning of this uh, event. And in fact, the removal of UN troops may have opened the door for this genocide to occur. Now, uh, many individuals within the Rwanda government have been called war criminals, have been sentenced, the people on the, who were on the media. I mean, this was just like the Salem witch trials that psychologists have always written about in every introductory textbook. This is a case, think of the psychological issues here. War propaganda, the incitement 
in the media of the population. Scapegoating, like you called her a witch, you call him a cockroach. Projection, mass psychosis, mass murder, collective hysteria, collective psychosis, the psychology of propaganda. All of those topics are in our lifetime. I, this is another treasure trove of information for psychologists to learn about the human condition and about the dark side of the human psyche. And, uh, but it is not necessarily part of this ethos and the zeitgeist that is uh, au courant in psychology departments. So if we look at the number of articles that were published about the Rwanda genocide, which was not that long ago, this is in the 21st century, in the first 14 years of the 21st century, we see a few, okay? But if we start comparing that to other databases, that's where things get very, very confusing. The Rwanda genocide, if you put that in your database, uh, versus the word diversity, there are 243 times more studies on bias than there are about the Rwanda genocide. Okay? It's completely overshadowed by this fixation and almost obsession that psychology has with these politically driven topics. We're not, we're talking here about scholarly scientific literature that occurs in scholarly texts. If you're up for tenure, you want to get published in those journals because that counts towards establishing a, a reputation as a scholar. So uh, here's another one. Uh, the Tutsis were uh, the minority that was uh, slaughtered. Now, you would think that the attention that the political ethos gives to minorities would have transferred to Rwanda because this was a majority group, the Hutus, who slaughtered a minority in their own land, their neighbors, their friends, everybody in the village, everyone who sought refuge in the church. But if you look at the number of publications on Tutsis and compare that to the, the number of uh, publications on, quote, transgender, it's 254 to 1. Transgender people in the United States are a minority and deserving of study and attention. But Tutsis were a minority. In, in fact, there are 700,000 transgender people in the United States. There were 800,000 Tutsis who were slaughtered. But the ratio of how psychology devotes its time to one subject or another is, is, uh, is, is unbelievable how skewed it is, okay? No one is saying that studying trans, the transgender minority in the United States should be discontinued, but is it 254 times more compelling to the science of psychology than to see what happened to a minority in Rwanda? So, so I wanted to uh, extend this argument and look and just see how politically driven psychological research is. So let's change gears here. These, this is reality to your, uh, I think it's to your left. Those are the actual number of rapes in the United States and the actual number of robberies. So psychologically, both robbery and rape are psychological issues, but they both involve perpetrators for one thing sociopathic or whatever, or disturbed. They involve victims who are subject to trauma, and, that tra and they're also criminals who have uh, treatment programs and victims who have treatment programs. So psychologists could be paying attention to both of these problems and learning from them and helping those people who are victims of those particular atrocious acts. But there are four and a half times more robberies than rapes. Now, how do those publications that are put out by psychologists fare against these facts? Well, they're the exact flip. They're the exact opposite. There are almost six times more psychological studies of rape than studies of robbery, even though there are four and a half times more robberies than rapes. So there are four and a half times more victims of robbery than there are victims of rape, but there are six times more studies of the victims of uh, rape than the victims of robbery.
then you might say, well, there's a reason for that, or we can excuse that, or that's okay. But that is a discrepancy between reality and what psychology is doing. Okay, and this theme repeats itself over and over again. Reality and a disconnect that comes from our political zeitgeist, our perceptions, our attitude, our biases within the profession that uh, does not, uh, is not harmonious or synchronous with what is happening in the real world. Look, I was interested in finding further examples of neutral versus politically driven research. And that was hard to do. I thought about autism, okay? Autism is, there's an epidemic of autism and it seems that a person who would study autism with the therapies of autism, with etiology of autism, is not necessarily driven by political interests. So I thought I would compare uh, studies on autism with studies on those political topics. So. Autism, about 34,000 articles published in the 21st century, a little higher than diversity. That's nice, nice to hear. If you, look, if you search under race, again, autism outscores race. That sort of seems to be a healthy thing. If you search under bias, autism outscores bias. And you think, okay, well, there, there is the political research and then there is the apolitical research. So that almost was reassuring. And then I thought, wait a minute, what if, um, what if every study that you have in this graph was actually one psychologist? That would mean there were 34,000 psychologists working in the area of autism. It looks like there are 89,000 psychologists who are interested in politically driven studies, diversity, race, bias, versus 34,000 psychologists interested in autism. Now, obviously, that's a false analogy in a way because psychologists uh, publish more than one article in the 21st century per person. So uh, I was to say, okay, I want to find a more neutral a political topic and see how psychology scores versus its political. Is there more of genuine, scientific, neutral, apolitical research going on, scientific inquiry, versus this politically driven research agenda? So I thought shoplifting, that's even better than autism. It's more neutral. Uh, there is no political swirling around about uh, shoplifting. Um, children do it. Children who have conduct disorders do it. Uh, adolescents do it. Um, people with addictions and compulsions and OCD and kleptomania and psychopathology are involved. 30% of Americans are delinquent on their credit cards. Uh, and so there's a great deal of poverty going on. So shoplifting is symptomatic of, of, of that social condition. Uh, of people who are homeless or, or uh, senior citizens. So there's a, there are programs to uh, deal with shoplifting. There are st studies about recidivism. So all of that involves a lot of psychology, and it seems to be politically neutral. Great. So then I found a topic there. Now I wanted to compare that with something that was uh, a buzzword, politically loaded. So I chose intersex. Intersex includes ovotestes, mixed gonadal dysgenesis, Klinefelter syndrome, androgen insensitivity, and other issues that involve sexual confusion, sexual uh, discrimination. It is uh, something that is of interest to the political zeitgeist because this is a minority that is often bullied or uh, is a minority that is, has issues uh, in being accepted in society. So um, that seemed to be a good topic to pursue because one is apolitical, the other is quite political. Now, when we do that, when we set that situ situation up, there are 2 billion shoplifters in the United States and there are 150,000 individuals who are considered intersex. All right, so 13 times more of one than the other. 
Now, if psychology studied shoplifting, both subjects are legitimate for psychological scientific inquiry. We all admit that. Okay, so if there was a 13 to 1 ratio, that would mean that psychology was, in effect, had some reality contact here and was proportionate to what was happening out in the real world. But when you look at the studies, you, this is where the, the problem comes. There are twice as many studies of intersex persons than shoplifters. Okay, Even though there are, there are 13 times more shoplifters than people who co could be called intersex. So once again, this discrepancy keeps coming back and haunting us. And th th this is not pretty data to look at. So I thought... What about comparing shoplifters with hate criminals? There's another new, apolitical scientific subject area versus a political subject area. How does that happen? Well, in terms of reality, there are 2 million shoplifters, but there are 7,500 hate criminals. Now, hate criminals, is these are not people who were convicted of hate crimes. These were official allegations, charges of hate crimes. But there is a 266 to 1 ratio in the real world between these two. And these are both psychological situations that are deserving of psychological interest and attention. But when we look at what psychologists are actually doing with their time, they are spending three and a half times more of their professional, scholarly, scientific time studying hate crimes than they are shoplifting. Okay, 266 to 1 versus 3 and a half to 1. This is a disconnect between reality and the, the ethos of psychology departments. So I thought I would give psychology a personality test. Now, what do I mean by that? Psychology has personality tests. Let's give the profession of psychology a personality test. Okay, here are some personalities. We have Pol Pot, who was uh, known for his genocide and his brave new world experiment uh, on this planet. Matthew Shepard was a young man who uh, was gay, who was murdered in 1998. He received a great deal of attention in the uh, in newspapers, and he is part of the political uh, zeitgeist of psychology because this represents gay bashing, sexual uh, violence, and uh, it is an appropriate topic for psychology. Mel Gibson, uh, he got drunk and uh, was arrested by a Jewish policeman, and apparently the policeman recorded uh, the ranting and raving of Mel Gibson, and it, there were some anti-Semitic epithets thrown out, and... Um, he also did a movie called um, Passion of the Christ, which received some scholarly attention in that it had some possible anti-Semitic overtones. So Mel Gibson is up here as kind of a politically incorrect figure. He calls himself politically incorrect. Then there is Phyllis Chesler, who is a strong, uh, militant feminist. Okay. Now, uh, and, and then finally we have Cesar Chavez, who is a civil rights icon. So how does psychology proportion its scholarly time? Okay, so if you look at the scholarship in the 21st century, that is how it comes out, okay? The person who gets the least attention is Pol Pot. Mel Gibson, a drunken actor, gets more professional scientific attention than the greatest mass murderer since Adolf Hitler. Cesar Chavez has been dead for 20 years. Pol Pot's been dead for 16 years. Both people are deceased, but Cesar Chavez is getting 30% more attention uh, from professional psychologists who do scientific research in peer-reviewed journals than the greatest mass murderer since Adolf Hitler. Okay, this is egregious. I mean, we're not talking about tabloids or the National Enquirer or People magazine here. That might be expected. We are talking about 1,300 of the best psychological journals 
that exist in our profession that are peer reviewed that everybody would like to get into if they're up for tenure and they're, they want to do good, good research. It is that archive which is telling us that this is appalling. This is, um, this is embarrassing. Okay? So it's kind of like, um, it's, it's like, a, let me give you a metaphor if I could. There's a, there's a man sitting in his house. His wife is dying upstairs of a cancer. His two children are running around uh, neglected, uh, suffering malnutrition, and he's sitting in his living room uh, reading a book about Cesar Chavez. And someone needs to go up and say, listen, wake up, wake up, okay? You are not dealing with reality. You have lost contact with reality. You need to have an intervention. That is the situation of academic psychology today. So I don't know what the disease is called, that requires some kind of in intervention. Uh, institutionalized narcissism, confirmation bias, selective attention, conformity, my side bias, the bandwagon effect, cognitive inertia, denial, projection, censorship. I don't know the name for this disorder, but it is a disorder that affects and infects the profession of psychology. And it's incredible how few psychologists are talking about this. Steven Pinker talks about it a little bit, but it's, it's not a, a, a topic which has a great deal of a currency in the professional psychology today. So uh, my conclusion is, that, uh, is this. Uh, imagine there were 100,000 biologists and they have their own political controversy, Darwinism, creationism, creationism, Darwinism. That's their political dialectic in a way. So imagine, but uh, there are 75% uh, of biologists were doing research on this Darwinism creationism problem, okay? And they were ignoring things like Ebola and SARS and MERS and pandemics and the study of viruses and the study of infectious diseases and cellular structure, okay? Well, we would, uh, that would be very sad if that were the case. That is not the case in biology, okay? There is a minority of biologists who are involved in settling the dispute. And if most biologists are doing their science. That is not the case of academic psychology. It does not look like that is what is going on in academic psychology. So uh, there was a, a rather famous... Uh, person, James Watson. He's a biologist, a molecular a geneticist. He um, was the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. And he was interviewed. He was well into his 80s. And he was interviewed and he said some things about psychology. I would like his remarks to be the conclusion of this short talk. So I want to thank you very much for watching. And here is James Watson kind of summarizing what we've been talking about. You know, most psychology departments we get near them are, you know, not science departments. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people say, well, we have, to have something called cognitive science. Uh, uh, I like to believe, you know, that, uh, you know, that people would actually like to know the truth about themselves. But uh, certainly some people who would not want you to study whether, you know, in any way men and women are different. You know, <laughs> seeing that if you discover differences, they'll just perpetuate uh, wrong behavior. Uh, like, for they don't want you to really measure intelligence because uh, they don't want intelligence to be something you're born with as opposed to having to having it been largely determined by how you grow up. So, psychology departments now are, you know, just not as bad as anthropology, but almost as bad, just uh, totally dominated by political correctness. Uh, which to me, you know, uh, uh, 
in the past, uh, political correctness has never been a way to move toward the truth. It's like, you know, saying something is religiously correct. You start from that.